If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And before we start the interview, I just want to do a little shout out to a friend of the show, uh, Dr. Michael Osterholm. He's up there at SIDRAP, and I want to congratulate him on the air for his appointment as a U.S. Science Envoy. Um, he will be the Science Envoy for Health Security. Uh, combating biological threats by working with priority countries on infectious disease preparedness and uh, antimicrobial stewardship. So congratulations to Dr. Osterholm, and he's just a really, really good guy, and um, I'm sure he'll do a fantastic job. Now, on today's podcast, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a roundworm known as the threadworm, Strongyloides stercoralis. And joining me is parasitology teacher and author of the book, Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary, and thanks for joining me today to talk about this most interesting parasite. Happy to be here. Now, down here in the States, we call this the threadworm. That's its nickname. Is this also true in Canada? Not really. We do know that that's, that it's commonly called threadworm, but we tend not to call it that, at least in my experience. Um, I often worry that it might be confused with enterobius, right. so I always specifically call it strongyloides. Yeah, yeah, that's the reason mm -hmm. I was asking. I think I noticed that in Europe they frequently call pinworm threadworm. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Okay, I just wanted to clear that up before we get into the meat. Um, strongyloides is a nematode or a, a roundworm. Um, Rosemary, what's its geographic distribution? How common is it? It's less common than many of the other intestinal helminths, but it is found very widely in the tropical and subtropical areas of the world. We really don't know enough about its prevalence. It's one of those that we call the neglected tropical diseases. And if you look at the prevalence studies that have been done, there are many countries where it really hasn't been looked at closely enough. In some prevalence studies, virtually all people that have been looked at had it. So there was one in Papua New Guinea that showed that basically everyone they looked at. But other prevalence studies, anywhere from a couple of percent to maybe um, you know, 50 or 60 percent of people are infected with this worm. So it's common, but we really don't know how common. Can, uh, Rosemary, can you talk about its life cycle? Yes, it has a very interesting life cycle. Mm -hmm. If we start with the larva, which is usually passed in the stool, so the female worms lay eggs. Interestingly, Females in the human body are parthenogenic, meaning that they don't have to be fertilized to lay eggs that will produce a viable larva. The larva is passed in the stool, and, and if it is passed in the environment, then the worm will go through one or even a couple of generations of free-living nematodes in which there are both male and female worms. And then eventually you have the development of the infectious stage larva, or the filariform larva, we call it which is a skin penetrator. It uh, penetrates the skin and then does a migration through the lungs and is coughed up and swallowed and ends up in the small intestine where then the uh, the larva develop to adult females again. Uh, males aren't known in the, in the human host stage. And the females live in the tissues of the intestine and produce these larvae. Yeah, so, and then the, the whole thing starts all over again. So it, it penetrates the skin much like a 
closely related parasite, the hookworm. That's right, mm-hmm. yes. So often these two do travel together in places where you see hookworm, you tend to also see strongyloides. And that's one of the challenges, actually, is to determine the difference between the two. Um, and that kind of really leads into the next question. How do people get infected with strong, strongyloides? It is by uh, coming in contact with that infected stage larva, so that would be in fecally contaminated soil. And which explains why uh, we usually see it in the tropics and subtropics in the warmer areas of the world because these tiny larvae don't tend to do very well when temperatures get cold. But of course, during the summer months in other parts of the world, they could, they could be successful. Uh, concerning the symptomology of uh, strongyloides, um, uh, frequently asymptomatic, but uh, can, you can see some symptoms. That's right. Sometimes we see diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, maybe indigestion, an increase in eosinophils, which is really not a symptom but a a finding, Um, a rash sometimes, and the rash can come and go, and something called larval currents where the larva can travel quite quickly, and so the, the rash can move and it can create kind of squiggly lines on the skin. Also, this parasite can become quite widespread within the body, so it can do some organ damage, and of course, symptoms would depend on where the larvae are found. Yeah, and that really leads into the next um, uh, question, too, and I would like for you to really elaborate on this, because this is really important with this parasite. Um, Two things that are associated with strongyloides is auto-infection and hyper-infection. Can you talk about that, Rosemary? Right. Yes. I mentioned that it's usually the larval stage that is passed in the stool. So if the larva actually develops before it is passed in the stool into the infective stage larva, then it can penetrate the tissue and complete its life cycle without ever leaving the host. And so these worms can actually increase in number um, within a single host, which is fairly unusual in terms of the helminths. And they can, uh, like over years, they, they can continue to infect and reproduce themselves over years and years and even decades. Now, usually there is a sort of a balance between the, the human immune system and the worms, which keeps them in check so people may not even realize that they're infected with this parasite for years and years. But if anything happens to suppress the immune system, any kind of um, immune suppress- suppressing disease, for instance, or immunosuppressant therapy such as steroids or corticosteroids, anything that kind of brings that immune response down can trigger a hyper infection cycle in the parasite and it can become disseminated widely throughout the body. So it can be very dangerous. And of course, the danger is that you could be, you could have visited a tropical area years ago and, and it's long forgotten. And then for some reason your immune system um, breaks down or is suppressed years and years later. And you wouldn't even think that maybe you might have strongyloides. And so every once in a while we see cases of people who suddenly have a disseminated infection, you know, 30 years after they've been to Vietnam or some other part of the world where they picked up strongyloides. Yeah, very, very serious. Um, mm, Rosemary, that can be fatal. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, concerning the morphology of this roundworm, can you uh, first, is there even an egg stage that, that is ever even seen? Well, there is an egg stage, but usually those eggs, uh, the larva exit from the eggs, I think, before they, before the female even deposits the eggs anywhere. So uh, normally we do not see the egg stage of the parasite, but there is that, the possibility that you might see eggs um, passed in the stool. And so that was the challenge that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. When we see something that looks like a hookworm egg, uh, we have to ask ourselves, could it be a strongyloides egg? And when we see a larva in the stool, likewise, we ask ourselves, is that a strongyloides larva or is it a hookworm larva? Usually it's the egg stage of the hookworm and the larval stage of strongyloides that is passed in the stool. So all things being uh, normal, uh, that is what you would expect to see. We don't see the adult worm uh, very, very rarely because she spends her time in the tissues. 
and um, the the larva is quite characteristic if you can see its morphology really well, which is one reason why I like to see them in a wet mount rather than in a stained slide because sometimes you can see the morphology a little better. But there are a couple of characteristics we look for, one being what we call a short buccal cavity, so a short kind of uh, structure where its mouth would be, and then a large genital primordium, which is a structure that you see about two-thirds of the way down the larva, and it looks a bit like a, it's a flame-shaped structure that you see tucked into the side of the larva. So if you see those two things, you know you've got a strongyloides larva. Mm -hmm. and, and those are characteristics you would use to differentiate it from the hookworm larva. That's right, because the hookworm has a, a longer, uh, that structure at the mouth is larger, and the genital primordium is smaller, right. so it's kind of the opposite appearance. Sure. Um, can you talk about the diagnosis and treatment of this parasite? Diagnosis is usually and historically by doing a fecal concentration, so where we try and remove most of the fecal material and concentrate things like larvae and eggs and things like that. Then we just read it under the microscope and we look for those morphological details that I described. Right. Another um, method of diagnosis, which is kind of fun, is if you can get a nice, fresh, warm stool, take a little bit of it and put it in the middle of an agar plate, so a microbiology plate that would normally be used for growing bacteria, but in this situation, we're just putting a tiny little pea-sized bit of stool right in the middle of the plate, and then we incubate the plate, and if there are any larvae in that, they will wander out across the surface of the agar and sometimes even, you know, dive down below the surface and come back up again and hopefully leave a trail of colonies of bacteria behind them. And so the next day when you look at the plate, you can see these little trails oh. of colonies across the agar. Sounds like a high school uh, science experiment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very exciting when you get a positive. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. I also understand that a, a duodenal aspirate is also a good specimen for this. Am I correct? Yes, and, and I've I've read that the string test also has been successfully used, although I don't know if anyone's using the string test anymore, but I don't know if you know what that is, but it was kind of like a, a little spool of a dental mm -hmm. floss-like material in a capsule. Right. And so you would um, attach one end of the string to the person's cheek, maybe with a bit of uh, Band-Aid or a bit of tape, have them swallow the capsule, and then allow peristalsis to carry it through the stomach and into the small intestine. And it was very, and a very, a very absorbent piece of string. So it would fluff out when it got wet. And then you could reel it back in later and have a look and see if you caught anything. Sort of like fishing for parasites mm -hmm. in the intestine. Um, concern, oh, did you talk about treatment, Rosemary? I didn't really. Uh, usually just one uh, treatment with a routine antiparasitic drug is, is successful. I did read a couple of cases where, they, where it appeared successful, but the infection was rediscovered years later, so I guess it's not always. And it's, it is, um, it's often difficult to find these larvae. So you could have negative stool specimens, but that doesn't necessarily rule it out. And sometimes they even confirm an infection by um, seeing, you know, treating it with an antiparasitic drug and seeing whether that appears to work or not. So, yeah, it can be tricky. And concerning prevention, I imagine it's, you know, wearing shoes and uh, simple steps like that. Yeah, that's right. Not coming in contact with that fecally contaminated soil is the key to not catching strongyloides. Easier said than done, of course, in the tropics where it's warm and people tend to like to walk barefoot and not wear a lot of clothing and sit on the grass. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, my favorite part of the interview is uh, your your tales of parasites. What do you got for me today? Well, there was a study done in the UK in the late 70s, actually from 1968 to 1978, so a period of about 10 years, where they looked at over 600 ex-prisoners of war who had been interred in Japan and liberated after 1945. So this was, you know, 30 plus years after these fellows had come home. And amongst those 600, it was 602 actually, they found 88 
positive cases of strongyloides even after all that time. What what they found really interesting about these fellows was that they didn't have the typical symptoms. Um, usually the larvae weren't found in the stool and uh, sometimes they had an increased eosinophil count, but the most common symptom was that they had this transient rash which would appear and disappear sometimes within a day and in different parts of their bodies. And most of them were very kind of, you know, calm, blasé about it. Oh, yeah, I've had that ever since the war. I didn't think it was any big deal. So uh, often they, they didn't have any serious symptoms. But on the basis of this study, the, the researchers concluded that there were probably at that time between 1,000 and 2,000 people living in the UK with undiagnosed strongyloides just from having been in in the Second World War. Hmm. And if you uh, if, if you like uh, more interesting stories about parasites, I want to encourage you to check out Rosemary's book, Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest. And there's always a link to that on, on the website. And again, I want to thank you, Rosemary Drizdell, for your time and your expertise. Thank you, ma'am. My pleasure, as always. Thanks.